Alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We thank him for everything that he has bestowed upon us. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We send blessings and salutations upon all the previous messengers who came, who were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove mankind from darkness to light. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to use us to do the same. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless those who struggled and strove over the generations and the decades in a way that today we are reaping the benefit of what they did. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, there is a lot that I could say, a lot. But let me try and be systematic, and I'm sure you will take away quite a bit. When I was born, I was born into a home, obviously, in Zimbabwe. That's my place of birth. My father was a Muslim teacher. He used to teach the madrasa, and he was the imam in the masjid. And he had a concern for the local Zimbabwean population that was underprivileged. He saw a lot of Muslims and non-Muslims. He saw a lot of poverty. And obviously he was not in a position of wealth whereby he could alleviate that. Why I say this is because many of us want to do a lot about people who are poor across the globe, but we don't have the means. That doesn't mean we cannot contribute towards their success. But perhaps we will be able to do something to teach them a way, to give them hope, to give them courage, to help them, to motivate them. Someone who doesn't have wealth might have the ability to motivate another person to become wealthy. So you were part and parcel of that entire process of success without having been the wealthy one. A person who might not be a minister, for example, may be able to motivate a young man to become a minister when he sees qualities in that particular person. So let's not forget that part of our duty is to be able to think deep, not just think. Whenever I come across the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he speaks of knowledge and then he speaks of something deeper than knowledge known as fiqh. So al-ilmu means knowledge and al-fiqhu means a deep understanding. So the hadith says, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whoever Allah intends goodness from, you know, Allah is the one who intends goodness from us. So we ask Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, I ask you to use me for goodness. So Allah says, I intend goodness from this person. Remember to supplicate, you know, together with all our uh, energies and all, everything we've been bestowed with, we need to understand that the supplication is a part of it. You know, on one hand, you have the super religious who say, sit at home and pray. You tell them there's a problem on the globe. They say, just pray. I'm, I, can't, I don't have a job. Just pray. I'm sick. Just pray. I prayed and I died. Allahu Akbar. May Allah forgive us. Prayer is part of it. We don't deny that. Not at all. We have to pray. We will pray. But that's not the only thing. Allah gave you the capacity. Reminds me of someone on an island, you know, stuck. And they're making a dua to Allah. Oh Allah, you know, help me. Take me out of this island. I'm stuck. And so the helicopter comes. When the helicopter comes, they call out, Hey, come on. You know, we're here. They let the rope down. Just grab hold of the rope and we take you up. No. I'm waiting for Allah to help me. You see, Allah sent the help in the form of people who came to you to take you out of it. But because of your narrow mindedness, you understood it wrongly to think, no, I'm going to sit here. Allah himself is going to come. Well, that was Allah who sent some people. So let's understand it this way. The hadith says, whomsoever Allah intends goodness from, he will give them a deep understanding of the deen. Not just an understanding. And I believe that that is true regarding every sphere of knowledge. Not just the knowledge of the deen, but in any field. You have the doctors, there are some, whatever they learned at the university, that's it. And they come and they attend seminars, whatever they learn, that's what they practice. And there are others who are innovative. They are innovative. What do they do? They've learned, but they continue research. They try this, they try that, they come up with something else. You know, I know of a doctor who was a dermatologist. He came up with some products that nobody else came up with in order to solve some of the dermatological problems that people are facing. Why? Because he went slightly beyond what the rest did. That's a leader. You know, people say, well, when you lead, it becomes very cold out there. Because you know what? You're walking on your own. That's so true. One of the signs of the leaders, they will get flack from others. People might not understand you, but you're a leader. You walk alone. You know why? Everyone's walking behind you. That's what it is. 
You're a leader. They're all walking far behind. And when they're walking behind, they might feel lazy. Some will get tired. Some will sit down. Some will start pointing fingers. Some will say you're running too fast. Some will say you don't know what you're doing. In the essence is you are leading, aren't you? So those of us who want to be motivated by this, remember, a sign of leadership is when you're feeling a little bit lonely. When you have people who talk about you, negative, go onto the internet, search my name, you will find quite a few negative comments. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is if they are telling the truth, I need to correct myself. And if they are telling the truth, I will correct myself. But the bulk of them are just people who, you know, we call them sour grapes. That's what it is. Sour grapes meaning, you know what, when the grapes are a little bit high and I can't reach them, I just say, those are sour grapes. Why? Because I can't reach them. That's the reason. But they are sweet grapes, to be honest with you. If I could reach them, I would have. But because I can't, I blame the grape and I just say things. So that's why I don't worry. You want to lead, you will have to face challenges. People will tell you things. That must result in your positive growth, not in you giving up. If you gave up, you were never meant to be a leader. And if you did not give up, Trust me, even the sky is too close to be a limit. So, as I looked at this hadith, I told myself, you know what, I need to look deep into matters. And I invite all of you, when you study, whether it is politics, no matter what it is, don't just look at the surface. Go deep, go very deep. The deeper you go, the more you will understand, speak to people, get different opinions. What did we hear the Honorable Minister say a few minutes ago? That we want the opinions, we, we want to have this freedom of speech. Let's hear what you have to say. We want, ew, the minute you block people from their ideas and their thoughts, that's when you breed extremism. I believe that. It is so correct. You know, I'm sure you would agree that there is a discussion across the globe regarding the dress code of a Muslim woman. I'm giving you one example and there's so many other examples. So you have two extremes. One is those who force the women to cover their faces and whatnot. That is forcing. We are saying that, look, don't force. And on the other hand, those who force them to uncover. Notice the common word is force. That's the common word, force. The idea. Teach and preach. You should be free to preach what you believe is right because who knows, you may be able to convince the world to be, you know, to follow what you have. And if they are convinced that this is indeed the best way and they follow it, you know, you might achieve something great. But those who oppose you should also be free to air their views because it might help you modify your view and opinion in a way that you can perhaps perfect it or at least achieve something closer to perfection than what you had initially. Say for example, I come up with an invention. I invented, say the phone for example, or I came up with a new type of a phone. And then I have other people in the technological field starting to write reviews about my phone. I cannot just say, no, these people are jealous. I need to look into it and I need to be able to look deep enough into it to see. They are talking of the camera on my phone. How can I improve it? Is it right what they are saying? Yes, okay, let me improve it. They are talking. But if I close that entire door and I don't even want to hear them and I don't allow them to even say anything, technology will never go ahead. I'll never improve. I allow them to. I don't want to use the word attack because that's the wrong word, but to have their opinion which may be negative about what I have produced so that my product can become positive. The same applies in every other aspect in living. Remember this. So that's why when someone says something, look into it. I was saying the common factor here is force. The same applies to everything else. Take a look at the extremism that we face across the globe. I just want to give you a little scenario that we chatted about slightly just before we walked into this hall with the Honorable Minister. I tell you something. If you take a look at what happened in Brussels, absolutely unacceptable from any aspect. You are killing innocent people, men, women and children who have nothing to do with the war that you are using as a reason for doing this. Do you get the point? A lot of those who died were Muslim. Do you know that? A lot of those who died were considering entering into the fold of Islam. A lot of those who died were against the war. A lot of those who died may have not even voted. You know, I, I'm using these examples because these are some of the things these people have said. 
the, the, the people who have perpetrated crimes, they say, no, the, the public are definitely guilty. They are warriors because they voted the people into power who are now attacking the nations. Listen, how do you know where they put their vote? How they casted their vote? How do you know? Even if you casted your vote for such and such a person, it does not necessarily mean that you agree with everything they've done. I'm just, this is from, hypothetically, this is obviously from a certain angle. But for me, no matter what it was, it's still wrong. However, they say that because you attacked someone far away, we are now attacking you. I said that's unacceptable. But the point I want to raise is the problem of extremism is not only among the Muslims. Immediately after Brussels, in London, in Paris, in America, in Belgium, in so many other countries, non-Muslims began to attack Muslims. Do you know that? So many that the women in hijab, men who look like Muslims, men who look, who, who were not even Muslim. There was a Sikh who's, you know, a Sikh is a totally different faith. But because he has a beard and a turban, he was attacked. By whom? By the same type of bigots, but belonging to a different faith. Sometimes not even a faith, an ideology. What were they doing? They said, you guys attacked us in Belgium. We're going we're gonna to wipe you out. We're going to do this. There are statements being uttered even by politicians today. That we wonder what their, their IQ is. Someone asked me, you know, what do you think the IQ of these people you, who are uttering such comments is? And I said, I don't know. They said, I don't even think they have an IQ. It's like minus 10. <laughs> I don't know. But if you hear the statements, you get shocked. People in authority saying things that are absolutely absurd. They haven't studied. If it is human nature that if you were to punch me, I would want to defend myself. But... If you were to punch me and because I couldn't punch you back, I decided to punch someone sitting next to you, I am the fool. But that's happening on both sides or on all sides. The reason is, let's take a look at Brussels, like I said. Those who perpetrated such a heinous crime are saying that you punched someone, now we want to punch someone else because we can't punch you back. And at the same time, after they did it, and do you agree with me, none of us seated here, and none of the vast majority of the two billion Muslims on earth agreed with what happened in Brussels. Do you agree? Yes. We don't agree with what happened. None of us have agreed, but you pay a price. For who? A, f a group of people who have a warped understanding. You pay a price. Try and travel today to Belgium. Oh, what happens? You pay a price. Not only Belgium, anywhere. Apply for a visa to somewhere. See. You don't blame them for having scrutinized people a little bit more. But even if you were to get there legitimately, some of these nations, the advanced nations, the United States of America, for example, they face a problem where there are bigots who attack the Muslims as a result of the actions of a few Muslims. That's exactly how some of the Muslims attack the non-Muslims as a result of the actions of some of those non-Muslims. That's what we're saying. So... When you're a leader, you look deeper than just the statements in the media. You look very deep. It's called al-fiqhu, a deep understanding. What happens? You start asking yourself, look, we need solution, man. The solution, what is the cause? So now they start making you blame one another. You know, as you know, there is politics amongst the sects of the Muslims. It's nothing to hide. Among the different sects of Muslims, this one belongs to this sect, that one belongs to that sect. There is always animosity and it becomes a game just like politics where each one wants to gain a following and each one wants to portray that they have the upper hand and so on. And sometimes they become very low in their approach. So what happens? The Muslim becomes confused. So we seize the opportunity, just like political parties. If one man made a political error, for example, and I'm definitely not speaking about Malaysia because I don't want to interfere in your internal politics. I just pray. You know, you know what I said right at the beginning? As, an, as a foreigner, I just pray for the peace of your nation. Whatever you want to do, please make sure that the solutions to your problems do not create bigger problems. That's all I'm saying. The solutions you want for your nation, think hard, very, very hard. Because this nation is like a fragile piece of artwork that has been painted through years, decades, centuries into such a beautiful painting. Don't try and correct a little cobweb on your painting in a way that you break the entire painting. That's all I'm saying. You want to 
correct something, do it in a way that will solve the matter. I sit and I think about Syria, I think about Libya, I think about Afghanistan, I think about so many other nations, I think about Yemen, and I tell myself, if they sat around the table for 50 years, it would have been better than to take that nation back 100 years. People are not patient. You don't want to sit around the table. People become impatient. A leader is not impatient. Look at the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was patient. One after he had the help of revelation of Allah, he was a prophet, but still he was very patient. When the opportunity came, yes, it happened. But he waited for that. He was not impatient. If Allah wanted, the messenger could have come and in five minutes he delivered the message and walk away. But Allah wanted it to last 23 years. Do you know that? Why do we want solution quickly? Sometimes when you are impatient, your impatience creates a bigger problem than the one you are trying to solve on the ground. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, let's get back to the other issues. I don't even know where I was, but <laughs> let me try and... So, if we take a look at the issues that are occurring across the globe, we will find that some people just look at the media and they say, okay, that's the problem. Yes, now I know where I was. Okay. So, the internal politics amongst the Muslimin there will come a time when, like I said, if one politician makes a mistake, even though he is a brilliant politician, everyone makes mistakes by the way, those who are against him or who belong to a different political party may use the opportunity for this one mistake that was made to ignore the 500 things that he did that really resulted in the development of his ministry for example, and they will bring him down based on that one item, knowing perhaps or ignoring the fact that there may not be a suitable alternative. Are you following what I'm saying? So they are not worried about the nation. They are worried about themselves. This is what happens. When you are worried about the nation, you go to the minister or you go to the MP or you go to whoever it is and you address the matter in a beautiful way and you are patient with it and you make sure that you keep trying because you have like I you know I gave a similarity of a painting it's a very good it's actually a very good similarity I'm thinking of it now because it takes a long time to paint and it takes one minute to break or to splash other paint over it that destroys it you know the painter has a beautiful painting one mistake in it for example it doesn't make the painting bad so what happens in Islam as well as, as a religion, the people of different sects, they become opportunists. What do they do? When they see that the world has an issue and perhaps people are now concerned about security and safety, they quickly begin to portray that a certain group is the problem. Do you know what? Actually, if you studied it deeply, if you looked very deep, you would realize its qualities that are a problem. Extremism exists in a lot of different sects and faiths. And like I said at the beginning, even people who don't belong to any faith, even amongst atheists, you have bigots. You have people who are so passionate about what they call towards that they don't give the others an opportunity to even open their mouths. So how do we have to combat this? By preaching and promoting tolerance and coexistence. Live and let live. You want to follow this opinion? No problem. You don't want to follow this opinion? It's okay. Let me give you some examples. Because I want to get it straight to where I'm going. Look. If for example, a person decides that, you know what, I want to cover my face. Tell them, okay, for as long as you're not being forced, for as long as you firmly believe within yourself that that is something you need, and for as long as you don't shove your opinion down the throats of the others, you're okay, you're good to go. And there is someone else who says, I don't want to. Well, we've got to tell them, look, the same rule, exactly the same needs to be said to them. For as long as you believe this, for as long as you do not shove your opinion down the throats of the others, I'm talking here from a political perspective as well. That's your opinion. We may want to discuss the issue. You know, we call it da'wah in Islam. In, in the political circles, they don't really call it da'wah, but it is. It's calling towards your opinion. What am I doing? I'm trying to convince you why I believe at least you should cover your hair, for example. But that doesn't make me a bigot. What makes me a bigot is when I don't allow others to have their opinions or to express them, 
That's what it is. You know, I faced a problem, an issue, because I once made a statement, and this is something that I'm ma making mention of. The reason is we're talking here to youth, and we're talking here to people, inshallah, who will be leaders. You know, as you progress, you learn, you develop, you change. You, you know, sometimes your strategy changes, sometimes even your ideas may change. If they are guided a lot of the times with revelation, then there will be minimum changes, because it it's all goes back to revelation. But I want to give you something quite simple that you will all relate to. I'm sure you heard of this issue of Merry Christmas. Did you hear it? You heard it all. Oh, so people started saying, Mufti Menk said you shouldn't say Merry Christmas to the Christians. I'm sure you heard that. Why do you want to just take a small piece of the statement and hold it out like this and make it seem like we are people who, who do not believe in, you know, a multicultural coexistence, multi-religious coexistence and so on? Let me tell you, I was asked about it recently in Singapore. And the reason I'm making mention of this is to show you that look, we're not stupid. But sometimes people who want to look at it based on how the media has portrayed it may come to a decision or a conclusion that is not enlightened. They haven't considered everything. So what happened? You see, we grew up, I grew up in Zimbabwe. We interacted from a young age with the Hindus, the Christians, the Jews, those who are from the African traditional faiths and so on, and we got along. We mixed in the schools from a young age, and as I grew up, I went to a high school that was purely Christian Catholic. And that was the best option we actually had. They allowed me whatever I had, we, and obviously we catered for them, they catered for us. There was a lot of respect, and that's how we developed. Okay? However, when it came to Christmas, there were so many Christians who didn't believe in it. They said, no ways, this is wrong. I recall a young boy, I even know his name, and he was with me. He didn't used to like to participate in religious studies because he belonged to a certain sect of Christianity. And he used to say, these guys don't know what they're talking about because X, Y, and Z, and he gave his reasons, that's not the topic today. But there are Christians who don't believe in Christmas. They don't participate in it. Is there anything wrong if they don't believe in Christmas, Christians? There's nothing wrong. They didn't participate in it. There's nothing wrong. But the minute they put a block on someone else who believes otherwise, then there's a problem. That's what we're saying. So the question you have to ask yourself, did you stop people from celebrating what they want? No. Did you ban them? No. Did you disallow them? Did you spread hatred against them? No. All you said is, Lakum dinukum waliyadin. You have your faith and I have mine. So as we grew up, there were a few Hindus who, grew, who were with me at school. One of them used to eat beef. And I asked him, I said, how come you eat beef? Isn't this supposed to be your, you know, one of the gods that you consider uh, you know, a god with respect to them, with due respect to them? But he says, no, this is a special beef. I didn't understand that, but it was just that, okay, I'm not such a strict Hindu. That's what it meant. There were other Hindus who would tell him, listen, you are wrong. There were other Hindus who told him you are wrong. And there were other Hindus who tried to correct him. But he kept on eating it. And then when it came to Eid al-Adha of the Muslimin, they would never congratulate us. Why? Because we are sacrificing or slaughtering their God, so to speak. We never ever felt bad. Don't expect and please don't expect a Hindu to tell you Eid Mubarak at Eid Al-Adha. Respect them and understand that what you are doing is blasphemous to them, but they've allowed you to continue. It doesn't mean they hate or they are intolerant. It just means that they believe differently and they have a separate system of belief and it would be insulting to them to actually come onto this side here and tell you, look, as much as you're cutting my God, but well done, welcome, enjoy it, you know, enjoy that. You don't expect it. Come on, use your brain. This is what tolerance and coexistence is all about. It's not about a statement. It's more about allowing them to believe what they have to with respect in a way that you respect what they have as well. That's all it is. So what happened is as time passed, it was amazing because when it comes to the other faiths, we found the same. People didn't participate in some rituals of other faiths that did not make them bigots. But they respected each other. There was a young man who became a Muslim from the Hindus. The day they were 
You know, when they, when they die, what happens is they burn the body. They put it, they cremate that body. So this young man, his father had died and they were cremating the body and they asked him as the oldest son to actually light, light the fire. And he said, look, as much as you want me to do it and that's my father, I'm sorry, it goes against my beliefs and it caused a commotion until some of those who were wise, who knew, they said, look, that's the man's beliefs. Come on, leave him. Let the next son do it. How can you impose on him some... The, the, the idea is to coexist with your difference. That's what makes you a rainbow nation. That's what it is. But you don't shove your opinion down the throats of others. Just like now, in the Western world, they are banning you from covering your hair in some countries. That would create another problem. Why? Like the Honorable Minister said, it would make people feel that they are at war with the system. Because hey, you know what? This is my basic right to believe something. I believe this is wrong. I believe this is right. That's the idea. So, from among the Muslims, there are those who believe that it's okay to participate in, in Christmas. And from among the Christians, there are those who believe that it's not okay to participate in Christmas. Look at the irony. But the idea is, if you believe that, by all means, go ahead. You are answerable to Allah, not to me. If this one believes otherwise, go ahead. But please don't impose it on me. If I don't want, it's one of those things. Come on. You know, live and let live. Today, the problem is with all parties. We believe we are the only ones who are right. So we want to shove our opinions down the throats of the rest of the world. If not, they are the problem. They are the terrorists. They are the issue. They are this, that. Watch out. The words you are using will be used against you as well. Be careful. So this is why we say, as I grew up, I, I, you know, still we used to sit and eat together as young boys. College. You know, you have your lunch, they have their lunch. We knew that if you have a beef burger, please don't offer it to the Hindus. It's insulting. It's blasphemous. They would actually feel so hurt. Don't. Would you ever, if you have Hindu friends, actually tell them, hey, have some beef. I don't think so. Exactly the same could be said about pork and the Muslims. Do you agree? Imagine if your friend says, just is a pork burger, come on, bacon tastes nice, you know, come on, come on. You know, how would you feel? They respect you, you get along with them, you build the nation, you contribute towards the building of the nation together. Do you know that? But you have different dietary restrictions which are respected. So, this is something that we need to talk about. It's got nothing to do with this person is intolerant. There is a big difference between difference of opinion and intolerance. Very big. I can differ with you right now. I can differ with you on a hundred matters, but I'm so tolerant. I promote tolerance. I promote coexistence. I promote the fact that all of us should contribute towards the development of our nation. Here in Malaysia, you have people, you have the Chinese, you have the Malays. You, on, on the other hand, you have Muslims, you have Buddhists, you have perhaps people who belong to Christianity, maybe even, you know, Jewish people, whatever other faiths, I don't know how the, the nation is made in terms of, you know, the various faiths, but I'm sure there are more than 20 or 30 different faiths. Look at the civil service, you will have people belonging to every race and to every religion, and they are serving the nation. That's what they're doing. What are they doing? Serving the nation. So as a Christian, he might want to invite you to Christianity. As a Muslim, he might want to invite you to Islam. As a Buddhist, they might want to invite you to Buddhism. That's part of life. Everyone engages in their da'wah. So as Muslimin, our duty is to portray and present Islam in a way that when they see the way I serve the country, the way I'm dedicated, my honesty, my integrity, the way I cater for all people and not just for the Muslims, they will then realize this man is indeed a true leader. I am so motivated by the fact that he's a Muslim. You hear the point? The problem with us is I'm a Muslim and I'm a leader. And this is obviously a lesson for all of us. So I think that because I'm a Muslim and a leader of a multicultural, multi-religious nation, I should not cater for others only for the Muslimin. No, 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 relax. You need to cater for everyone. There will be people who are in your nation who belong to other faiths. Some of them may really think that your faith is absolutely wrong. So you tell me, you know, once I was sitting on an aircraft and I have a lot of time on an airplane. And I had an atheist sitting next to me and we were talking about faith and he said, you guys are very bad. The Muslims, I said, no, you get good and bad in every faith. He said, not Islam. I'm saying, what do you mean? 
He said, Islam, everyone's bad. You believe in Quran? I said, yeah, Quran, we believe in Quran. He says, this Quran, it's got bad things in it. I said, what? He says, you know, it says that anyone who's not a Muslim is going to hellfire. That is very bad. You guys are filled with hatred. You guys, I said, brother, you don't believe in hellfire. Why are you worried? That's the irony. Atheist, he doesn't believe in the hereafter. And he's telling me we are bad because we believe everyone's going to hell. I said, by the way, the Christians believe the same, the Jews believe the same, the Hindus believe the same, and most other faiths believe the same. What about them? He said, no, but they don't have a Quran. I said, okay, this is a bigot. This is a person who really doesn't know. He is so uneducated. He hasn't mixed. I learned more about other faiths and inclinations and different types of people. When I traveled the world, subhanallah, I thank Allah for giving me that opportunity. I came to Malaysia the first few times when I visited here, I didn't know. Every one of us is brought up in a certain environment. I was unaware of so many things. I learned as time passed. I've now got so many friends in Malaysia. Subhanallah. And I've learned so much to say, you know what? The little cocoon that I've been in all along, I need to know that there are different cultures, different ways of looking at things. People who like different things, you know, roti, chinai, and whatever else, it doesn't come in Zimbabwe. It's not there. Okay, that's just an example of food. <laughs> but in everything else, I mean, I, you know, we, like we, are, we grow up, I'm going to let you know something very interesting. And we follow, we read Salah in a specific way. Since we were young, innocently, you read Salah the way you were taught, you get up, you, you, you know, you, you're not exposed to so many other things. When I came to Malaysia, the first time I was exposed to some different things that were happening. And to me, I'm like, why are they doing this? Why are they? When you go to Mecca, don't you see some strange looking things? I mean, I, for the first time in my life, saw people who read Salah. They just come to the Saf. You know what's the Saf is the line. They don't raise their hands when they're starting their prayer. They just come and they stand. And I'm thinking to myself, why is this guy not starting his prayer? Next thing he goes into Rukua. You know, he goes in. And I'm thinking, when did he start? I didn't see it. <laughs> did you know that that is one of the opinions of Imam Malik ibn Anas? It's a Maliki Matham. It doesn't make him a bad person. And when he sees you doing this, he's saying, what's wrong with these guys waving hands all little, every little while? So it's what you are exposed to. These are opinions of the fuqaha. They are juristic opinions that are valid. They're not bad. But you won't know, you will think this is bad because you're ignorant, you haven't mixed, you haven't interacted sometimes. And sometimes they are matters of culture. So someone asks, for example, you know what? I have my culture and my faith. Which one comes first? Oh, what, what a crucial question. It's a crucial question because people need to know the answer. And there is a very enlightened answer. Enlightened answer. A beautiful answer to that. Look, I tell you, we have cancelled a lot of our culture because as we became educated, we realized that some of it was wrong. I'm not talking of religion. Here, this what I'm just saying is, I'm not talking of religion, just the culture alone. I give you some examples. The issue of how we've treated our women, for example, culturally, slowly but surely as westernization took over, I'm not talking of religion, we began to delete things. You know, in Zimbabwe, the age of majority at one stage was 14, they moved it to 16, they moved it to 18, and now they want to move it to 21. Why? For many, many reasons. So people start picking on the fact, they say, you know, at the Prophet's time, oh, they were, they were pedophiles, astaghfirullah, they married very, very young people. You know what? I always tell them, the enemies of Muhammad, peace be upon him, never ever raised the issue of the age of the spouses. Why? It was the norm of the time. At that particular time, in your culture, it was norm. At a certain time, for people to marry much younger, because why? They were mature, not only sexually, but even, you know, mentally. They were mature at a young age. Today, you have someone who's 25 years old and they, they're not even mature. Do you agree? I hope they don't shift the age of majority to 25. <laughs> My son is so upset because he read an article in the newspaper saying, that the driver's license age is going to be shifting to 18 and he was always banking on the 16 and he was so upset because he's about to turn 16 and then he tells me two three days later i found out that it, it only applies to those who were born after a certain date and, and i'm safe i said okay you're lucky <laughs> but this is how it is so we change things that we were used to because new things come about not necessarily the faith now when it comes to the faith and religion, they have a beautiful relationship. What is the relationship? 
We believe that you take the goodness from the culture. Any part of the culture that does not contradict and go directly against the faith, you will still keep it, still have it. A lot of, you, you know when you see someone, you say, this guy is cultured. What does that mean? He's got manners, he's got character, he's got some deep-rooted, beautiful ways and habits. That's what I would think it means. But if they have bad ways, do you say he's cultured? You wouldn't say that. So, it's religion that actually came in and confirmed that all the good that you are doing should remain. That's what happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Do you know, people say when you accept Islam, you must change your name. Have you heard that? Have you ever heard that? Please just say yes or no. Okay. Now, go back to Muhammad ﷺ's time. They didn't ever change any names besides those names that had bad meanings. Have you ever thought of that? Abu Bakr was Abu Bakr even before. Umar was Umar even before. Radiyallahu anhum. Uthman was Uthman even before. They didn't change us. Only those that had bad, bad meanings, they were changed. And one or two exceptions. But it became our culture where Mary, ah, you must change it. Ah, but that's my name. Okay. Yes, it's not wrong to change a name, but don't let that become an obstacle. This is what I'm saying. And now you go back to culturally, people will still believe you're not a Muslim until your name has changed. Do you agree? That's what people believe. So religion is telling you, stop snatching people's identities away. You know, you have Paul. He could be a Muslim, he could not be a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, how do I tell? I tell by the fact that I see him in the masjid. I see him with Islamic habits and characters. He eats halal food and so on. That's how. Because there are people with Muslim names who are far away from Islam. That's the point I'm raising. So subhanallah, you know, when we grow up, we grow up in a certain society environment. Sometimes there will be a difference. I'm just guessing, but I, 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 the guess is probably right. There will be a difference in culture from the people or between the people from the north and the others from the south. And some from the east and some from the west. Difference in culture. So what happens? Some of these cultures make it so difficult to get married, for example. And then we start saying, you know what? Culture comes before faith. You know what? i would be honest with you. Culture and faith go hand in hand. If there is anything bad that is happening, delete it because it is bad. That's what it is. Like the issue of marriage, it's become so difficult to get married, so it increases sin. That's what we've been speaking about. The convention we had the last two days, the straight path convention, one of the points that came out of it is, every time you make something halal difficult, you are making something haram easy. If you help your children get married and the cost is not so much, I know as a marriage counselor for the last 16 years, there are so many marriages that they go to take bank loans in order to have a massive party. The marriage is broken one year down, but they are still paying the bank loans for three years. How's that? Whereas if you had a simple function, you know, you made it easy, they would be married, they would have children, they would have responsibility. I have another issue. There are people who say, you're not allowed to marry until you own a house and a car and you have this and you have that type of a salary. Yet, the parents themselves, when they got married for 20 years, they didn't own a house. Our parents, you know, youth here, by the way, you were saying youth, you know, some of those who are grey have made their way in. Uh, I, I, I've always found that with youth programs. When you say, stick! youth that's a greater invitation for others to come you know so they they argue so what is youth and the best answer I got so far is anyone whose age is made up of two digits is still young mashallah <laughs> that would mean from 10 all the way to 99 alhamdulillah so if you're if you're 99 you're still fine but if we were to facilitate and make things easy subhanallah it would really really uh, result in goodness on earth. Like I was saying, our age group, our parents or perhaps our grandparents, when they got married, some of them couldn't afford shoes. Do you know that? Some of them didn't really have houses. Some of them never had proper jobs. They were not so wealthy. But now that we've arrived at an age of materialism where everything is to do with money, do you know what? The poor guy is 21, 24. He wants to marry. And we are making it so difficult. We're putting conditions. You must have this, you must. He needs to be responsible. That's what it is. Same applies to our leaders. You are the youth. What do you need? Responsibility. 
The hadith says, إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ When someone comes to you, their level of deen and their level of character is good, let them get married. That shows us that they have the characteristics of leadership. You are dedicated, number one, you are focused, you know which way you are heading, and you are responsible. Your character is exemplary. The problem with today's leaders, and mashallah, I'm so glad that I've met the Honorable Minister, and he's actually what I thought he would be, gauging from social media. Because you have people sometimes, the minute you have a ministerial post, the minute you have some form of qualification, the minute you've crossed a, th a certain threshold of wealth, it changes their attitude. It changes the way they carry themselves in such a way that they become arrogant. They become inaccessible to the rest. They, they create a barrier and a distance. They are no longer worried about the masses because they've arrived where they wanted. And that was all it was about. The hadith says, Sayyidul al-Qawmi khadimuhum. The leader of a nation, if you want to know who he is, he's the one who actually serves them the most. So in position of authority, you will serve more than anyone else. You will be humble, you will be just, you will come out, you will reach out to everyone. Those who agree with you, those who don't agree with you. I was telling you at the beginning of this lecture that I grew up in Zimbabwe. You know, my father, I was so fortunate to witness what he did. As I was young, there were people who spoke against him. They worked against him. They lied about him. They, they tried to make his life difficult. And every time he would call them, invite them home for tea, talk to them, try and sort the matter out and see. And I was a little kid. And we would say, but why are you doing this? These guys, they don't like you. He said, look, this is what life is all about. Minimize the fronts of conflict that you have. A true leader will minimize, you know, the fronts that they have where people are against them. I can solve the problem. Go and keep on speaking to them. And I've seen so many people come and praise him later. Recently, there was a man who made us cry. Old man, he came home and he says, look, I don't know. I, I may die anytime soon. I've got a health problem and I want to tell you. And he's speaking to my father and we were there. He says, I want to tell you that. I have harmed you. I have done so much against you. I want your forgiveness. Every time you just kept on helping, you kept on assisting, you kept on calling us and we kept on harming you. But today I realize that you are a true leader. And by the way, my father's achieved a lot in a short lifespan. He's still there. Alhamdulillah. May Allah grant him goodness. But what I learned is dedication. Continue working. When you have a deep concern for your enemy, oh, then you're a true leader. You're a true leader. Why? I have a deep concern for the one who doesn't like me because I know that if I pray for him, I try with him, I reach out to him, I may be able to, you know, contribute to positive growth for all of us. The minute I channel my energies to attacking one guy whom I can solve the problem with, I am wasting resources that could be channeled towards the development of the entire nation. That's what it is. So this is why let's think very deep. Let's think very carefully. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I told you at the beginning, I have a lot to say, didn't I? And I've spoken longer than I expected to speak. I'm, I apologize for that. But at the same time, inshallah, may Allah grant us humbleness. May Allah grant us humility. May He grant us genuineness. May we really f reach out to people, not just Muslims, but people of other faiths as well. Understand them. Let's have this live and let live policy. Like I was saying, you know, it's not an issue of Merry Christmas. If you want to participate, you participate. You don't want to participate, you don't. You believe it's okay, that's fine. You believe it's not okay, that's fine. It's all up to you. It's you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to preach this way, you may. You want to... But don't promote hatred, don't promote violence, don't promote intolerance. That's what develops extremism. We need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have open minds. We will live and let live. We will allow people to have their opinions, to incline in whatever way they want to incline, on condition that they don't trample upon the toes of others. They will afford us the same. Like I said, and just to clarify it, I am never ever offended when someone doesn't wish me Eid Mubarak. I'm never offended. And you know what? What do I say to my Christian friends? Well, have a happy holiday, seasons, greetings, and so on. I've still done the same thing, but I've just 
Born in mind that I have a faith. There's nothing wrong. And like I say, there are people who may disagree. There are scholars who will also have another opinion. By all means, that's also a good opinion. I didn't say it's not. And I didn't say you're not allowed to follow it and I'm the only guy. But why shove down my throat an opinion that I may not have yet seen the light regarding? And why should I shove my opinion down theirs? No, it's a matter of discussion. That's all it is. And it doesn't make us bad in any way. And I believe if we think that it makes you bad to have an opinion that is honest and that is not trampling upon the toes of others, then we're heading in the wrong direction. We, we, we should listen. We should understand, tolerate. Look, it doesn't mean that we want the solutions to the problems that are facing the Muslims, so we must water down Islam. No, Islam's been in existence for so long. People are saying in America, okay, because now I need to live in America, I'm taking off my hijab, I'm taking off my skirt, I'm taking off my trousers, meaning I'm taking off everything. What are you going to walk with, naked? Even if you walk naked, they will still brand you, mashallah. Even the youngest from amongst us is dressed the best, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. So you don't have to give up your faith because of people who have a warped understanding. No, continue teaching the people that look, I'm a Muslim. For example, I'm a Muslim and I will, I'm a good Muslim. I'm a devout Muslim, but I'm reaching out to you. I love you. There are sects among the Muslim. We get along. That's how it should be. We should be getting along. We should greet each other. This business of labeling people kafir is one of the roots of the problems we have. And that does not exist only with one sect. Trust me, it exists with many, many sects. When you have a difference, you know, this one's a kafir. Why? For what? Why use heavy terms? Obviously, this might be understood by the Muslims more than others. But we know it's a problem because the minute you label someone with these labels that are so heavy, do you know what will happen? It creates a sense of uh, going back to some rulings in the hearts of some of the Muslims and you know the ruling of apostasy for example some of them have made mention of some harsh rulings the problem is the people start taking the law in their own hands that's where the problem is a few days ago I, I saw a clip on YouTube there is a singer called Junaid Jamshed I don't know if you heard that name what happened to him is he's a Pakistani in one of his talks he was a singer and he, he turned to the Dean and he became a little bit more serious about his faith but still he was promoting something saying something in his statements you know we are human beings I'm sure we have a slip of the tongue now and again it's normal look I'm speaking to you without a paper so it's definitely possible in fact I would have slipped up here and there either linguistically I might have said one or two things I may not have finished what I started and so on. it's normal human beings that's what we are someone picked something and said this man is blasphemous against Aisha radiallahu anha the man apologized and he did it publicly and he put it up on all forums but two days ago he landed at the airport in Lahore and a group of Muslims with big beards they started beating him up and they broke his glasses and they were hitting him and he ran away as big as he is and why they said he's a kafir you know he's an insulter of the Prophet the man apologized a long time ago for the slip of the tongue it was a statement that he made. He said something about Aisha radiallahu anha, whatever it was. And he acknowledged, look, it was a mistake. I read a narration. It was a false narration, whatever it was. But they beat him up. Those are the ones who are listening to the others who are sitting back in their little parlors, calling this one kafir, that one kafir. What happened? As a result, the public took the law in their own hands to hit him. There's a difference of opinion. Leave the man. But he apologized on top of that. And still... What was the root of that? It was because someone somewhere called him a kafir. That's what it is. Relax. If I have a difference with you, I could say, my brother, this is a deed of disbelief. That's correct. But to label you, hey, this one, that Allah has kept one entire day to do that. It's known as Yawm din the day of judgment. Don't judge people just like that. If, if people were non-Muslim and they accepted Islam, or people were sinful and they came to the right path. Remember, there would also be people on the right path who later become sinful. It could be. So don't be judgmental. Try and contribute positively to everyone. Try and reach out to all. If you see something wrong, there is a way of correcting it. Think and think deeply, not, not just shallow. Think very deep. People are generally good, but the devil comes to us and makes us love gossip and start up a problem. And we get, we get excitement when we see people fighting. Yeah, you see it's gone there and it's the, for what? 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gather us together. In Jannah, the same way He has gathered us here. May Allah bless you all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Nabi Muhammad. I'd like to answer that question from two different angles. One is from a medical perspective. Uh, you all know that bad habits should be quit. Agreed? Uh, how many of you s smoke? Okay, I don't want you to put up your hand because I don't need to know. Okay? But I'm sure those of you who do smoke, you, you acknowledge it's a bad habit, it's a waste of money, you know uh, that it's wrong to sell cigarettes internationally, not from an Islamic perspective, but internationally it's wrong to sell cigarettes without having a disclaimer where it says cigarettes kill or smoking kills on the box itself. So it's a bad habit, we should eradicate bad habits. So if smoking is so bad, uh, weed is worse. Like we always say, the only, subhanAllah, I'm sure you've heard us say, say this before, that the only weed that is permissible in Islam is Tajweed. Okay, so actually that weed, the we, we now from a medical perspective it's bad. It's so bad and even if people think oh it does good to me and so on, it's bad, it's wrong and anything bad we should not be doing it. From an Islamic perspective the ruling is it's prohibited. So I hope you get it. From an Islamic perspective, it's prohibited without a doubt. And from a, even from a medical perspective, it's so bad that if you were to travel across borders with that in your pocket, most countries in the world would jail you and some of them might execute you. May Allah forgive us. So <laughs> I hope you understand that. Uh, so Alan Kedua, think from the man tadi. Islamist, I'm a Christian, and this is by far the most powerful one I've ever been to, and thank you so much for that. And um, my question to you is, as a non-Muslim who believes that every faith uh, advocates peace, and I constantly face uh, many questions from my Christian counterparts when it comes to defending uh, Muslim or uh, Buddhism, I mean sorry, defending Islam or Buddhism or Hinduism, um, I sometimes have this question where you say that Islam does not uh, promote terrorism, but all terrorists are Islam. So, I, when it comes to that, I have to take a step back and I find it a little bit difficult in defending that. Because I say that there are Christians who are bigots, there are Christians who promote uh, terrorism, there are all, all sorts of uh, faiths who have bigots. And what could I mean? How how can I give a better answer to this? Yeah, I mean, it's much. Uh, I think what's important for us is to learn and to read and to understand uh, and to see. Uh, what has happened in the world is crime is perpetrated. If it is perpetrated by anyone who is not a Muslim, it's called a crime. And if it's perpetrated by a Muslim, it's called a terrorism. So it's just the word that they've changed. So terrorism, the new definition of it, and I'm sure they might put it in the Oxford Dictionary if they were, if they were truthful, the new definition of terrorism is crime perpetrated by Muslims. You see, so, so that would exclude all non-Muslims. And I say this because we read this, the press, we know what's happening in the, in the media. You know, I'm, I'm quite uh, well versed with what's going on at the moment. And we, are, we feel so prejudiced against when it comes to matters of this nature. You know, you have McVeigh. He is not called a terrorist. You have anyone who's Christian. You know, the Sinn Féin, for example. You have the Lord's Resistance Army. You have the Christians, the Tutsis and the Hutus in, in Rwanda, for example. The ethnic cleansing that's happened all, in a lot of countries. These people have massacred millions of people. But they're not called terrorists. Why? Because there's, there, there, there is some form of a... a you, know, you know, normally people say, don't... Uh, uh, don't just feel pity on yourself by saying things. But there definitely is some form of an agreement to 
tarnish the image of Islam. And I never used to believe this. I used to think, you know what, these theories and all that, they're wrong. But one thing that is quite clear is, Islam is still the fastest growing religion. You know that. I, I don't know if you're aware of it. And this people cannot understand. They asked me yesterday or the day before, why is Islam the fastest growing religion still? And I tell you the reason that I feel, having spoken to a lot of the women, because the bulk of those who are entering the fold of Islam are actually women. When they feel that we've now been enslaved in such a cunning way that we don't realize we're enslaved. They used to be naked a long time ago. You know, Robert Mugabe is the president of Zimbabwe. So he said, or, you know, we all know that he stands for morals and values and he's very strict when it comes to certain things and he doesn't want to budge when it comes to certain issues, right? Now, I'm saying this in a good way that many, many years ago, the colonialists came to Africa, they found them dressed in uh, feathers and leathers and skins and they had spears and you know the traditional African dress. They told them you are backward, you need to clothe, cover yourself. So they covered themselves. 200 years later they told them you are backward, remove the clothing once again. So, so now when they are going back to dressed, to being dressed in less than what they used to be dressed a long time back, they are being told you are liberated. And yet in the middle, they were honestly saying dress, because when you dress, you are liberated. So what is it? So what, what's happening right now is the women who are becoming fed up of being enslaved by the makeup industry, for example, so enslaved that they cannot even walk out of the house without having spent 400 ringgits on the face. It's a reality. And they can't walk out. They can't without this and without that. They start thinking to themselves, hang on. How come we've gone back to the stone age where we've taken out all our clothing and we're dressing for a, for a, for a, for a male dominated environment to soothe the eyes of the males? There was a time when we wouldn't dare tell a woman, you're looking gorgeous. I'm talking about 40, 50 years ago. No one would have come to my mother and say, oh, you're looking lovely. She would say, hey, shut up. You know? But today you say, you're looking lovely. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, wow, we'll actually put it up, we we'll like it. Oh, someone acknowledged me, you know? Because it's all become this issue. So people start feeling this. And what happens is they realize, let me cover up. Let me become truly liberated. People must know me for my contribution to the nation. People must know me for my uh, service to the rest of humanity. People must know me for my character and conduct, not just what I look like. So what happens is, they, th when, when the people who studied what's going on on the globe saw that as much as Islam is being portrayed in a negative way, it's still growing so fast. To be honest, words started coming out that would only depict Muslims. So terrorism is an act done by Muslims. Like they say, there was a man, you know, for example, it's just an example that's given online, and I've read it, where they, the, a man saved a dog, right? So people said, oh, this man saved the dog. What did he do? He, he, the dog was on the highway and he ran after the dog and he saved the dog and he actually brought it to safety. So there was an article saying, wow, man saves dog and so on and so forth. And then they found out he was a Muslim. And what did they say? They, t they, they then put a headline to say, a terrorist Muslim disturbs the peace of a dog trying to cross the road. Come on, come on, come on. Now this is just an example, obviously, it may also be hypothetical, but at the same time, it goes to show that even the Muslims understand that that word terrorism is abused. Look, we are approximately one and a half to two billion Muslims on the globe. If Islam was actually a terroristic religion, nobody would exist. They wouldn't exist because... Ah, can I stand up? You are a non-Muslim. Agreed, my brother? Do you feel safe in this room? Mashallah. You feel secure, don't you? We're all Muslims around you. Remember that? <laughs> MashaAllah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. I think I've just made my point. Shukran, shukran. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm just curious about democracy. Is democracy is a way of Islam? And how about uh, Shura? Can you explain? Because I'm not sure about the concept. Jazakallah. Yeah. Uh, democracy uh, is, is a term that is used. We need to understand what is meant by it. And what I've noticed is over time, it's also being modified. 
it's being modified. So Islam has a system that's not modified, it's there. Uh, shura is something that is quite close, whereby you seek the opinion of the majority of people. But in Islam, the difference is there needs to be qualified people to be able to seek guidance from. So if I would like to participate in a Shura, the people that I seek guidance from must be qualified in what I want to ask them about. You know, I cannot ask a person who's a plumber about someone else's heart disease. I need to get a doctor. And on top of that, I need to have a doctor who is genuinely concerned about the cause. Let me give you an example about Shura. If I were to get married, and I wanted an opinion about a certain girl, and I want to ask someone, you know, is it worth it or not? I need to ask someone who knows me, perhaps who may, who may know her, but who has a genuine feeling for me. Because if that person doesn't have a genuine feeling for me, they will intentionally give me the wrong opinion. You know, if there is a guy who's eyeing out the same girl, he will tell me, very bad idea. Don't, she's a bad woman. And two months later, the two are getting married. <laughs> and what did I do? I asked opinion. So the shura also has a lot of... The shura has a lot of restrictions or rules and regulations. It's not just a sort of opinion, but it goes to show that the opinion of others counts even in Islam. That's what it goes to show. So, you know, if, if you were to say Islam and democracy, the, yes, the two may not be of the same understanding the way it stands today, but I want to inform you of something interesting. Many years ago in one of the countries, there were... Ten political parties and there was the election happening and the party that came into power had 30% of the vote and the other percent the other 70% was scattered through the other nine parties one had 5% one had 11% one had 12% one had 8% whatever else it was so we were looking at it and studying it and we were saying that look at this democracy it's brought into power someone who only has the support of 30 percent of the masses 70 percent of the masses don't want them there but they are sitting there later on we got to hear that no you have the runoff and you have various other uh, ways of ensuring that the majority wants this person but then what you're doing is you are minimizing the number of candidates so I'm voting just because, yes, it's a runoff. I only have two choices, for example. I have to make one of the two. But in essence, I wanted a third person. So there are a few things that could be there that still will be modified as time passes with the democracy that we know. Similarly, in different countries, it's practiced differently. And what I've learned is in some nations, it simply doesn't work. You know, it's some nations where we have a culture of a different nature and in particular I'm referring to some of the Arab nations where you've had you know chiefs and kings and so on if you were today to replace that with the Western style democracy you would have what what's happened in Iraq what's happened in other places that's what you would have because what happened people said Saddam was a dictator look I was quite younger at the time but Later on, what happened today, there are so many people who fought for the removal of Saddam Hussein, who will confirm and tell you, we would rather have been under his rule than what's happened today. I'm just saying this. I'm not saying I said it. I'm saying there are so many people who, were, who fought for the removal of Saddam Hussein, who say that, you know, what we are witnessing today, we had a better life under Saddam. So... A guy like me would sit and look at that statement and think to myself, well, what is it? Maybe they were not educated, maybe there was something else. Or, like I said in my talk, we went to solve a problem in a way that created another 10 problems. So, yes, uh, we do have a connection, we do have an overlapping, and we do have areas where the, the religion and that do not see eye to eye. But one cannot condemn the other completely. We take a little bit from here that fits there, and a little bit from here that fits there. And subhanallah, like I say, I wouldn't like to interfere in the internal affairs of your nation. And that's the reason why I don't want to tell you, don't do this and do that when it comes to matters of this nature.
so much my sister it's the same thing that I said about the Hindu that was having the hamburgers okay which means it is common knowledge that some people take their religion a little bit seriously some people don't it doesn't mean that those who take the religion seriously are bad people it doesn't make them bigoted I know of really good Muslims who are lovely people and I know of people who read Salat five times a day but they're so horrible I wouldn't like to mix with them I promise you, I'm sure you know some people who dress appropriately, they, are, they read five times salah, they'll even make the hajjud, but they have no way of character and conduct with the people. They cheat and deceive and steal and they, 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 they harm others. And yet you have some who might not be so externally religious, but they are so beautiful in their ways and habits and so on. That is all part of the test. You must keep on calling towards goodness without losing hope. If you believe you're a Muslim, you've seen your sister sister or brother who's a Muslim participating in something wrong or consuming alcohol, it's your duty to beautifully convey the message. That's what I do all the time. We talk about goodness and we do not lose hope. If you, if you see carefully, if you try and look carefully at my social media presence, Twitter for example, maybe Instagram for example, Facebook for example, there is a consistency in positive messages throughout. I try my best not to let negativity be shown because everyone needs hope today. We're living in a hopeless world. I'm so sorry to say that. Everything you look at is trying to snatch your hope away. Everything you look at is making you despondent. At least you keep on smiling, keep on having a good message, keep on trying, you know, and keep on reaching out to people. It will make you feel good and it will help others. Trust me, I am so moved by the fact that Honorable Minister here has actually said that he follows quite closely on a daily basis and he receives a bit of that motivation. SubhanAllah, I'm sure it may be the same with all of you. Well, if that's the case, this is what makes us brothers and sisters in faith. And this is why... Please, don't be judgmental. Everyone who is sinful is potentially a really lovely person. They would come across, if only you made the right effort, keep on doing your da'wah in a positive way. Please, don't go around and say, you know what, you're going to hell. I remember the young people, there was a time when no one used to want to listen to uh, religious scholars. You have a religious scholar coming in, no, the, the, the attendance is poor. Or it's all old people ready to go into their graves who are there wanting to know how do I go into my grave. Why? Because there was a gap. They used to come to the masjid and say, right, the punishment of Allah is severe. You are going to the fire if your hair shows. You are going to the fire if you are going to do this. If you go to the nightclub, that's it. You're doomed. No hope. So the man thinks, you know what? I'm doomed. I'm going to the fire. I've got a place in the fire. Let me just make that place a little bit bigger so at least I have some space to move, you know. So at least I have some space to move. So what happens is they are doomed. They feel doomed. They feel bad. They feel evil. They feel negative. They don't want to listen to the message ever again. And they already feel religion and me. We are two different things. I'm sorry. You know, I, I, let's see what happens when I die. But there, now we are trying to change that. By giving messages of hope, Allah is forgiving, Allah is merciful. You know, no matter what you've done, come back to the path. It's a beautiful path. Try and do your most. In the straight path convention that we just concluded, I said in the concluding remarks, if you have moved one millimeter, we have achieved. One millimeter. Why? So long as you are heading in the right direction. Today you will have a leader who's right at the top of his, you know, maybe ministry like we have the honorable minister or even a nation. He was also born one day. And you know what? He also learned language. He also didn't know how to speak. And then he spoke. People were patient with him. He grew up in an environment. It might not have been absolutely ideal, but he made the most of whatever was there and continued and continued until a day came when worldly success was achieved. And now, inshallah, we will look at the success even of the hereafter. And this is why I'm convinced when I sat and I heard the Honorable Minister quoting verses of the Quran, I was touched. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless everyone. It's not easy because a lot of the times you see a minister, you see people, you think, okay, these people have succeeded in terms of the world. But perhaps they may not really be bothered sometimes about the hereafter. That is changing. They are bothered about the hereafter. They want to reach out to people to be able to quote accurately. It wasn't just inaccurately. Accurately. Verses of the Quran is something that motivates a person like me. The only thing is I will coach him about how to intonate the verse, inshallah. So, the next, time, the next time you hear him, he will recite that verse in a melodious way. 
and then you can nod your head and say mufti mang mashallah may allah bless you guys may allah bless you may allah... let's have patience with one another barakallahu fik next question ada tadi uh, the sister kat depan tadi kalangan tuan selamat datang how to reach out to people who think some of them are things that um Islam are only for the and some of them even use that to uh, to save Islam as a reason for the racist bismillahir rahmanir rahim once again uh, many people don't embrace those who have reverted to Islam from other races and it's a weakness we have we will have to work on it I think the new generation, our generation, those who are seated here, we are more open-minded in this regard. Even when it comes to marriage. You know, my generation and a little bit older than me, if you wanted to marry someone who's not exactly from your type, your race, your system, your clan, your part of the country and so on, our forefathers or our fathers would have had a big problem in that regard. They would say, no ways! I don't mind you can marry a person from the street for as long as he's Malay it's okay. You know what? Whether they are Chinese background, Malay background, whether they are African background, Middle Eastern background, trust me, true Islam is that that also should be okay. That's what the Prophet ﷺ came to teach. So this is where we say we have to quit that culture. Didn't I say that? You know we were talking about what comes first, culture or religion. In this particular case, it's a cultural superiority complex that makes us feel that it's just us. We are the only ones. No. In this case, I'm sorry, but my religion will have to take over. I'm going to have to delete what might be prevalent in my culture, thinking that we are the best. And I'm going to have to allow this to happen. If my child comes and tells me, I would like to marry a Caucasian or a Chinese or someone from the Philippines, I'm going to say, no problem, I'm the first person to support you. So it's us who will have to make the change. We will have to make the change. And this is why when, you, when, when I see people of other cultures and other races, normally I go out of my way to give them importance. Give them importance. And I ask you to do the same. Give them importance. This smile breaks barriers. People accuse us of being very cold people. When I sit in an aircraft, and I told you earlier that I do that a lot, I make it a habit to greet, to smile, to share, to say things, no matter. The person can actually think you're a bad person. Initially, that's the way. You know, a guy walking into an aircraft with a big beard, look, dressed in an Islamic way. You know, that's the last thing you want to see on a plane. Do you agree? <laughs> but as you, as you walk in, you smile, hi, how are you doing? And I'm fortunate because, you know, I fly so much that now when, you, when I enter the aircraft, uh, a lot of the times you get the crew coming to greet you because your name is on a list of people who travel a lot, right? So they come to greet you and then the people are wondering, why are they greeting him, you know? And I have another one where a lot of the stewards and hostesses would know me personally and they would come and greet me by name and say it's an honor to be flying. I actually had one of the flights where the captain announced, he says, Mufti Menk, ladies and gentlemen. And I was like, Wallahi, Wallahi, recently. And he says, it is an honor to be flying my mentor. That's what he said. The captain was talking on the, and I'm like sitting like, and I started sweating because, you know, I was like a little girl blushing. May Allah forgive us. <laughs> I'm think, I, I wasn't expecting that. But what happens as a result is people realize that, you know what, you can be a good Muslim with a beard and you're such a friendly person. You reach out to us. I promise you, I promise you, if there was a gay who was drowning, I would be the first one to dive in and save him. I'm just letting you. Why? Because he is a human being. That's what it is. Did you hear? What I said, people might not agree with. I will have scholars who might even fight me to say, how could you say that? I disagree. He's a human being. I may not see eye to eye with you on certain matters. It doesn't mean that when you are drowning, I'm just say, ah, by the way, go, pour, pour more water, let him drown. No. No matter who it is. You know, there was a man who was asking me a question. He was asking me about uh, something and I gave him an example. I said, if your wife was drowning and I was standing next to you and I was the swimmer and you couldn't swim, what would you say? You would say, please go and save her, wouldn't you? Why? Because you are the swimmer and you would pray for me while I go there. You would pray for me that I brought her back safely and you wouldn't mind what I look like. 
You really wouldn't mind. I could have a longer beard than this. And when I came back, there are so many Muslims who have done this. So many Muslims who have reached out to non-Muslims. No one talks about it because you know, sadly, media sells. The news sells when it's negative. When it's positive, it doesn't sell. So when you have a beautiful session with an honorable minister and we've spoken so many, they will pick on one negative thing and they will talk about it. That's called media. And that's why we have journalists whom we believe will make a difference inshallah they will not do they will talk about good things let's start talking about how many nice things are happening on the globe if for every one act of terrorism that's going on on the globe there are hundreds of thousands of acts that go unmentioned of people you know i was watching the news about singapore there was an award they gave of the singaporean of the year something of that nature there was a lady who helped a non-muslim in a supermarket did anyone read that story? Yes. What did she do? This man, he actually uh, sadly missed himself, old man on a wheelchair, and him, the couple, elderly couple. And people were walking, Muslims, non Muslims were walking past. One lady who's a Muslim decided, let me help them, man. She actually took that old man who was not related. Now we will sit and say, not mahram, not this, not that. All that put it on one side. She was the only person who reached out to this non-Muslim guy in Singapore. And she assisted, cleaned him, bought, she purchased for him clothing to wear another you know, set of longs. And she then took him home and they, there was a relationship that developed to this elderly couple where she would visit them now and again and their lives changed as a result. She had an award of so many thousands of dollars and she was acknowledged by Singapore at large. She's a Muslim. But that was a news piece of article only in Singapore. I read it because I followed the news. The bulk of the people may not have read it. I thought it was a big deal. If I knew this woman, I would have actually gone to congratulate her. So there are hundreds of thousands of those type of deeds that happen on a daily basis. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. The problem is with us, sometimes we do stick rigidly to some factors that are not really supposed to be. Like this issue you're raising of uh, Islam being only for the Malay and so on. No. Back at home they say Islam is only for the Malawian, you know, because it was there in Malawi for a long time. No, it's for everyone. Learn to embrace people. It's up to us to let our children even marry into people of other races because we will then be able to make the difference. No point in talking about it and then when it comes to your chance, you say, no, 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 it's still not going to happen. Why? Make the change. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Assalamu alaikum Muslim. One of the major problems happening especially in this country is the act of labeling someone uh, as Wahhabi and the other parties reclaiming themselves as uh, Ahli Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So this is the situation is uh, I used to follow one of the uh, well-known ustaz in this country and always quoted his words. But I encountered some Facebook pages uh, attacking him being one of the Wahhabi and proof with some screenshots of his wordings. But both parties are holding Islam as their religion. So what happened is it creates doubt in my mind towards the ustaz. So uh, can I seek explanation for this issue? Thank you. I didn't want this catch question, but anyway, it's the last one, so let's go for it. Uh, as much as I wouldn't like to address the matter, I have to. Okay? Let me explain something. It's not an issue of Wahhabi, non-Wahhabi, what, what. People have been here for years on end. It's an issue of intolerance. It's an issue of extremism on all parties. I believe every Ustaz makes mistakes, without exception. Take the good from all of them and leave the bad. When someone preaches hatred against another, discount it. And if you have the opportunity, go to them and tell them, please, don't talk about other people. I want to ask you a question and I'm going to stand for this. You know who I am, right? I'm a brother of yours in faith. Have you ever heard me talk bad about another person? Mashallah. <laughs> MashaAllah, the innocent have borne witness. Do you agree? <laughs> Why? I have so much of goodness to share with the world that I don't have time to worry about others. Come on, come on. Those who talk about others don't have something to present themselves. I am busy doing my work. So many people send me messages. Oh, someone called you a Wahhabi. Someone called you a Sufi. Someone said you're a Salafi. Someone said you're a Deobandi. Someone said you're a Baralvi. Some of these names, I don't even know what they mean to be honest with you. 
I was waiting for the day they said someone called you a chocolate man because that's more that's true, you know. But all these names for me, I say, hey, look, I know what I am. I'm a Muslim and I'm trying to spread a good message amongst all groups. Let me carry on doing my work. The minute I turn to fight them, I become a fighter. I cause a bigger problem. And now who's going to do this good work? Because my energy, like I said earlier, all the energies are now being utilized, waste of resources, to do something where it's going to be less beneficial, in fact, destructive. So please do yourself a favor. When you hear labeling, you need to be more intelligent than the label. You need to rise above it and tell yourself, whatever good is coming from this person, I will take it. Whatever bad is coming, I will discount it. The reason is, even if you belong to one group, it does not mean the ustazas of your group, everything they say is right. They will also say wrong things. You will have to pick it up. And it doesn't mean that there is a Christian across the road, so they cannot teach you something good. I have had people who taught me mathematics and geography and biology and sociology and English language, who were Jews and Christians and Hindus and people who belong to other faiths. I took from them whatever I had to and I left whatever I didn't. You follow what I'm saying? So when you go to the university, you will have a lecturer who might be gay, for example. You know, I'm not talking about this nation in particular, but maybe in Europe, okay? You take from them whatever you feel you need to take from them and leave the rest. I'm there to study petroleum engineering, for example, or whatever else. I took whatever I had to and that's it. And I respect them for having given me what they did. That's humanity. The problem with us is, the problem is all over. We all are guilty of labeling others. This one is this. Let's, let's understand. It's qualities that make us or break us. You have a bad quality. Look, I'm sitting with people. I don't need to know what inclination he is or I am. I know I get along on common factors that are 9,999 compared to the one item that I might, I might find that I'm different with him in. Do you know? So this is why I say, let's not allow our nation to crumble based on this labeling that's going on. Take the good from everyone and leave that which is not good, no matter where it's from. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. May Allah bless your nation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you strength and growth. And may whatever issues you may be having be resolved in the best possible way that results in the true growth of your beautiful nation. Jazakumullah khair. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.